Today, I'm talking with Gerardo Martinez, Naval Academy alum, Marine Corps veteran, and founder of Wild Kid Acres. So go Navy, beat Army, and get ready for today's episode of The Justice Podcast. Everybody wants to talk, but nobody wants to listen. So here's my petition. Instead of division, let's make our mission to change the system. Learn how the world works. Learn how we can act. Welcome, everybody, to the Justice Podcast. Well, Gerardo, why don't you go ahead or Gerardo, how do you? It does not matter to me. I go with, but I go by the kids here call me Mr. G. I go by Gerardo. The only thing I don't go by is Jerry. That's like the one thing I don't go by. <laughs> <laughs> That's fair. Yeah. Um, well, just for the audience, uh, why don't you introduce yourself and explain what Wild Kid Acres is? Sure. My name is Gerardo Martinez or Gerardo Martinez or whatever, but um, I own a little farm called Wild Kid Acres that's located in Edgewater, Maryland. It's uh, just 15 minutes south of the state capital of Annapolis, Maryland, where I'm a graduate of the Naval Academy. Um, Wild Kid Acres is kind of hard to define, so it's a lot easier to kind of just like tell you how it grew organically and kind of like shooting at the hip rather than telling you what we do today, because it's different today as it is tomorrow and five years from now, hopefully. So, um, so kind of like going into my background. So I graduated the Naval Academy, served as a Marine Corps officer, got out, did a little corporate stint. And then I started my own company uh, where I did leadership and experiential development for executives. I did really, really well. I loved the work. I was traveling and doing all these cool like outdoor expeditions because I, I have a passion just to be outside. Um, and like going through that in 2019, I landed a job that took me to Cameroon, Africa. Um, and out there, um, we stayed on what is their community farm. It also serves as their church and their school and all this stuff in the middle of the jungle. And I just like fell in love what it was with what it was doing to kids. And since I have kids, I really care about that. So I saw these guys like, you know, kids were picking eggs in the morning. They were slaughtering their own food. They were picking mangoes every day. It was like, I was like, this is what Eden looks like, I guess. <laughs> um, um, and I just, I like truly fell in love with it. But probably the most important thing was that there's, they were so impoverished there. Like the average salary is like 80 bucks a month. So instead of uh, like exchanging $5 for eggs, right? We would sit down and if somebody was buying eggs from the community farm, they would sit down and just talk with you for like five hours. <laughs> so when you were done talking, that's when they were, they thought that the exchange was finished. So they, you know, like for an American and for, especially with people in the military, like I was like, you're late by five hours every day. <laughs> so it's like, what is going on? But it was, the they really like invested in that human capital exchange rather than just strict cash or, or even like bartering. It, it, there was almost no bartering as well, which was insane. Um, and that like really changed my wife and I who I brought with me at the time um and she I mean she had like broke down in tears almost like every day <laughs> but it was it was pretty amazing um and she she and I are both city kids like I'm from Chicago she's from like Buenos Aires Argentina but she grew up in Baltimore but when we came back we were like how do we emulate what we experienced in Africa in the United States and with all this privilege that we have here, we were like, the only way that we can do this is like buying our own farm. So we were living in the DC area at the time, super urban. That's just like how we like, like to live it before. And uh, I, we just stumbled across this place in Edgewater that was covered in trash. And like the house was not the greatest. Um, we put an offer on it for, sorry, that was my dog snoring. I put an offer on it. Get out of here. He sleeps always at my feet. 
but um anyways yeah so we put an offer on it like super super low compared to what they were asking and the day we went to go make the offer there was a dead deer on the porch here and it was like sweet <laughs> like it looks good for us <laughs> so so they accepted the offer with the caveat that we would be starting a homestead for at least two years and that was the goal it's like we would just start a homestead get that farm experience for my family it's only five acres here and we were like that's the way we want to go like just homestead we don't know what we're doing we can't produce <laughs> so but like with everything that i do i get like hyper focused and like sort of obsessive compulsive and i like research the crap out of everything i i like became crazy passionate about agriculture because it was like everything that i liked like i love like working hard and see the fruits of my labor so like construction and all that stuff is awesome for me but also like it takes a lot of intellect to like plan your life around harvesting and especially here because there was so much trash it's very focused on the soil regeneration um so i, I got like super passionate so we bought the place in um we were like right at the tail end of september of 2019 but we weren't doing anything with it until november of 2019 so in November of 2019, we hired a contractor to renovate the existing house that was here. And uh, he quit the first day. So, <laughs> so he's like, this house can't be renovated. Your inspector failed you. Like you either need to get out of this mortgage or you need to figure something out, but I'm not doing it for this budget. And we like freaked out a little bit, but I was like, ah, like challenge accepted. I'll build the house myself. So with the same budget as a small renovation project, I was like, I can, I know I can do all these things that are within my limit. I can research how to do all the things that are outside my limit. And then the only like hard part is going to be making sure that I can get permits. So from November to January of 2020, I convinced the mortgage company that I could do it. Like I, was, I may have like mushed the truth on my capabilities a little bit, but like it th worked out. So in January of 2020, they were like, yeah, go ahead. You can build, you have the same budget. You have to make all this stuff ready. Um, like it has to meet like livable code. You can't just like take this budget and build like a tiny home. Um, so I, I did it. I started building the house in right, right before COVID and the beginning of March, like late February of 2020. And then COVID hit and I was like, sweet free time. <laughs> I got, so I got a lot of free time and I started building it. I realized I couldn't keep up with the trash pickup that was happening in the yard because it was building the house. And I also couldn't keep up mowing the lawn because I was like, I got a frame, I got to like drywall, I got to do all this crap, I got to get the roof up so it doesn't get ruined. Um, so just, and like the neighbors started seeing just like one dude moving goats every morning, you know, with his like little pig that he had and like all this trash coming out of the fields and they see this one dude like literally lifting walls by himself and Eventually, like my friends started coming on board and they would just like help me lift a wall one day because it was COVID so nobody was doing anything. Um, and then right around like midsummer, um, we got a family milk cow, a Jersey cow. And uh, that's when it got insane. Like people kept pulling, they pulled in my driveway every day to ask me about what are you doing? What's your farm like? Why are you building a farm here? There's no farms around here. Um, are you going to be selling stuff? And it's just, it got to the point where like, I was coming down off of scaffolding, like at least five times a day. And then one day in September of 2020, a lady pulled in and it had been my 12th time coming off the scaffolding from the roof. And I was like angry. <laughs> and I like, I, I was like, I'm going to tell, I'm just going to, I got to get a new trespassing sign, like big so that nobody comes and uh she got out of her car and just broke down crying without saying hi or anything and i was like well like and like not that i'm like the most empathetic person in the world but i like can't if you cry in front of me i'm just gonna be like what are you doing <laughs> i'm not gonna cry with you but she told me like it was like the height of the elections it was COVID again resurging and then it was all this stuff that was just like making her life horrible 
and she's like can I just pet a goat and I was like sure you can come and uh she like came in she asked me some really like super high level educated questions around like why what are you doing with all this trash it's like well I'm taking it out of here (laughs) but Uh, we replace all all the trash that we pull out of the ground, which was the year to date, we're at like 35 dumpsters. Um, Yeah, so we take all that trash out of the ground and we replace it with wood chips because they're readily available where we live in this urban area. So we put wood chips there so that eventually it'll, one, put organic matter in, become compost, and then become topsoil um, with the, you know, use of pigs and the cow poop and all that stuff it, it, it'll get naturally turned into compost um and she was like ah, this is like so amazing you should open to the public so in september of 2020 she convinced me to open to the public so she convinced me on september 5th so i opened up i use uh, the app calendly i don't know if you know that yeah the app calendly yep. I, I use the app calendly and i was like only one family can come a day you have to come at five so you can help me move the goats and feed the animals. Uh, and that's when I want to take my break to, from the house anyway. So you have to come at five. We accept donations for the feed, um, but it's not required. But also you like take all the risk of coming to this farm. Um, so I put that out on September 5th. Didn't tell anybody. We didn't have a name or, you know, it wasn't a company. I just told that lady. I was like, try not to tell too many people. On September 7th, two days later, Every single day was booked until January 15th of 2021, including like Thanksgiving, Christmas, New Year's, every day. And we were like, oh God, <laughs> like what happened? <laughs> we were like, okay, there's there's something here. And like my wife and I were not like, like heritage wise, we have farming in our background way back, but like we're not farmers. But so we're like, when people come, we're like, oh, the cow has horns. That's what happens. <laughs> like, <laughs> But we like, we like love, we love joking around. We're very like goofy people. So it was, it became this like little beacon of happiness uh, during COVID, which to us, I was like, I'm miserable. I have to build a house. I'm very tired every day. <laughs> so, um, but yeah, like, th- like through that, we started like refining the story of how we got here. We started talking a lot about like why we even have goats, why we have a pig why we have a cow, why we have that specific type of cow, why we have that specific type of pig. Uh, And we could like get up to like super high level stuff like regenerative agriculture, climate smart agriculture, you know, like what industrial farming is like, why we chose a homestead instead of production. Um, And so in January of 2021, we had this huge backing of people that wanted to come back, this huge backing of people that wanted to volunteer. And we decided to become like an official company and actually do stuff. So we focus on three goals and that's inspire the local community. Um, the second goal is to improve the local economic development. And the third goal is to enrich the local ecosystem through our like regenerative farm. Um, so those three goals, we like kind of just like put it out to the world. Like if you have something that aligns with this or this or this, like just reach out. We'll we'll make it work because we're the only outdoor venue that can make it work. Uh, so we started doing like goat yoga. We started teaching beekeeping. We started doing all this like crazy awesome education and like kind of alternative stuff. Like people would come and just like paint the cows or, and stuff like that. Um, and then also all these local businesses were like, hey, like we're really struggling. Can we like have a unique venue to host an event? And we're like, yeah, it's free. We just have to split the revenue. So there's no upfront costs, which during the time of COVID was quite a big barrier for a lot of people. Um, And then after like the businesses started going, we started having all this revenue that was like very weird to manage. Um, We decided that we needed to do something more. And so we allowed therapy programs to come Uh, So like certified therapists are coming and bringing their clients so that we don't take on the liability of, you know, the HIPAA laws and all that stuff. And they get to use the farm. They just need an animal handler with them, which we had hired uh, from all the other revenues. So they like do their therapy programs. It's super low cost. And they get to like do therapy with a cow. They do therapy with goats. They do therapy with our garden. Um, 
and then all the nonprofits started reaching out after that. And like, we started doing like free events for like a bunch of different organizations, a lot of like community involvement stuff with the police and all. It, it got like crazy with the amount of stuff that we were doing, but it's very in like, in our mind, we were like, all we have to really do is manage the farm and manage the calendar. Those are like the two big things, but we can really make a huge impact to make the world a little bit better. And also hopefully get to the point where like we make at least enough to pay for it. Um, and it did. So in 2021, we saw 6,000 people and we were only open for 80 days. And on those 80 days, we were only open for three hours. So yeah, which is like insane to think about, but we had farmers markets going we and you know our farmers market saw like a thousand people and we had like six vendors <laughs> so we're, we're everybody sold out and everyone's like we're, we're coming back and like beer comes like the, the local breweries come now it's it's like the super like community focused farm um so 2021 was like insane seeing six thousand people and i talked to every single one of those people <laughs> it was i i was uh, a little bit exhausted but when um when all this was going on, we realized that we needed infrastructure. Um, like we literally, the only structure on the farm is my, this house that I'm sitting in right now, the one that I built, which is not very big. Um, so we started fundraising for a community barn to build this like 5,000 square foot structure that will have a market in the front to do, to sell local farmers goods that we had friends, we had made friends with, but also we'll have open space to do classes and the yoga and all that stuff under a, like the safety of a roof and have stalls and, and you know like beekeeping supplies and all the stuff that we need to like actually be a farm so this like very flexible thing and then we realized that we also needed like a because we had like the therapy horses and stuff now um, we needed we needed some type of outdoor covered area just to like put animals in and be like this is a cow it has horns and it gives milk and <laughs> you know uh, so we needed like this outdoor like rotunda style gazebo but larger um so we started like fundraising over the course of 2021 this year that was our main focus we were like we need to fundraise to get this barn built so that we can get greater revenue to get bigger impact and hire more kids and, hire, and you know do everything that we want to do and like become this like beacon in the community um and so like in thinking of that we were like how do we how do we get to the point where we can afford to buy the barn without doing fundraising because i'm not i don't know how to fundraise i know how to like run a business but i don't know how to fundraise and also i, I i'm not good at asking for money <laughs> so so i was like well i'll I love the farming. Like I want to be a full-time farmer. So if we can find a production farm that is, you know, turnkey where we like take over their operation, uh, that, that would be the ideal situation. Cause I can, I can read like P and L's. I can read business stuff. I can read a crop plan. What I can't do is like buy millions of dollars worth of tractors and stuff like that for like a thing that I don't know specifically what I want to grow. So we actually just like just a few months ago, we signed a lease for a production farm, which is certified organic produce. Um, and we, our plan was, we're gonna use this lease to eventually purchase that farm. And also we'll use the lease to fund the barn build. And we're like, this is the way that we wanna grow. We wanna be full-time farmers. We wanna feed people. We wanna feed their souls and we wanna feed their minds. So now there's like three goals set in with this new farm. Uh, and actually, so that all happened kind of in the background. We, we, I actually haven't told anybody yet, so for you. So, so don't tell anybody yet. <laughs> but, um, and then another big announcement is in pursuit of the barn, I pitched the Maryland state legislator for a grant a bond bill specifically to pay for both the barn and the riding arena on this farm. Um, and two days ago they called me and they gave us full funding. So we got $250,000 to build these two structures 
And then, so now we have this other farm that's already in production, but nobody knows about it yet. It's like everything's still growing. And we, and these, the farmers that had previously took over, they gave us all their crop plans and everything, and they're advising us for the next year. So we're getting like all this like knowledge. And then now I have to build this barn in this rotunda, which will all augment it. So um, I don't know if you want to know, but this Friday we're doing a press release that we're gonna donate the entire harvest from that other farm to the food banks here. So, you know, that other farm, awesome. yeah, that other farm is 25 acres of certified organic produce that we're gonna donate. So that's like thousands of pounds of food. Um, which makes an, an impact here. I mean, there's a lot of the needy families in the DC area and the like DC Annapolis, Baltimore area, but it's still like, it's something, you know, and it's like high quality, organic, nutrient dense food. Um, yeah, so we're, we're announcing that on Friday at 2 p.m. <laughs> and like everybody's coming here. Um, but that's the, so our future of the farm is really trying to like really grow a community around us wherever we go. So like these two farms are separated by 40 minute drive and we our labor for everybody's struggling with the labor right now, but we, I, I have to like tell people to please not come. Like I need you guys not to help me today because I don't want to work because <laughs> I need a day off. So we're like, we have like our volunteer list is over 600 people long. We have, we have kids come in here and I teach them how to weld. I teach them how to do all this amazing stuff. And it's still like, just like crazy, crazy busy. And I, it, it's grown so big that I like, uh, I'm like super excited to be a full-time farmer now. Like now that I don't have my other company, I'm like, man, I like love what I do. Like, I love the fact that it's like chaotic but then in those interim times that it's not chaotic is the most peaceful thing you could ever do. You know what I mean? It's like crazy peaceful and it's just amazing. I, I love it now. So this is my life now. I'm going to die as a farmer and in this house that I built. <laughs> so. That's, That's so cool. cool. I, don't I don't think very many people, people can claim that they actually built their house with their own hands. Yeah. Um, yeah, don't do it. It's not fun. <laughs> it's, it's, <laughs> your, your your body will uh, tell you uh, it's not a good idea. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's so really cool. cool though. That's, that's, yeah, that's awesome. awesome. Um, yeah, yeah, I'd love, love if you could, could dive in um, a little bit deeper on what the process was with talking to the Maryland legislature. Yeah, man. Um, so... It was, it grew out of the same exact thing that happened to us before. It was just like happenstance. Um, my wife um, is an attorney and I, like I said, graduated the academy. So I have a previous engineering degree, but um, when we were really like serving as this like beacon of hope and since we had such an immense amount of people coming, uh, people took notice right they 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 take notice when things are going well for the community and like and especially during a time like covid you know like where everything was super like down um and everybody was struggling but when they came to the farm it was not like that they were like you want food here go grab something <laughs> you know it's like um it's a uh, so like people more or less like took notice of us, they were coming to us just like the others that were coming to us. So like when the Senator and the delegate and even the Speaker of the House and the Governor's cabinet have been here, it was like that grew organically and like, yeah, we leveraged a lot of relationships that I built from my previous company and my wife built through her like ascension into lawyerdom, <laughs> but uh you know, because we, we've, we had connections before, but not like, we never leveraged them. We never, they were just friends that we were like, ugh, politics, we don't want to be part of that. Um, so they, it grew and they visited us and we would take photos with them. Like, cause I take photos with everybody that comes here cause it's fun. <laughs> but, uh, um, when the speaker of the house from Maryland came, she was like, I see that you've had all these people come and you need to raise money for your barn. There's no, there's really no grants or any way to fund infrastructure build outs 
other than through very small things like equip which is through the usda they can do like greenhouses and high tunnels but like the type of structure that we need is not that um and then most almost all grants in the world fund programming they don't fund you know like infrastructure but the Maryland state legislature has the flexibility to look with at their budget and look at how it would impact the people. And that's our goal is to impact the people. So they looked at that and she told us like, you should really pursue a bond bill grant. And uh, she's like, talk to your local delegate, talk to your Senator who had already visited. So I was like, okay, that's easy. <laughs> but, um, and it was, I mean, it was a lot of, it was a lot of trying to like still keep up, like still keep like the tabs and play the balancing game of not trying to be friends with too many people too closely. And like the, pol the politics stuff aside is not hard. It's just making sure that you don't get too de dove into it. Um, but yeah, the, the grant process was like, I had to like, they called me, they said, submit a bunch of a whole lot of reports on your like build out. Um, and then I had to do a pitch to the Maryland legislator for just this local area, which then they shared to the group, large group, and then they voted on it through the budget committee and a bunch of other, and then it went into La La Land, where I don't know how laws work, so it's just, it went into like the politics land where they like did that stuff, and we are so lucky that we have an amazing senator, her name's Sarah Elfrith, she's amazing and fights for us, and our delegate, delegate Seth Howard, both of which so like senator elfrith is a democrat and delegate howard is a republican so like they are they fought for us i mean like so hard because you gotta imagine like a state like maryland any state people fighting for funds are everybody thinks their thing is the most important so <laughs> and it, rightfully so like there was amazing stuff and we got we are lucky to have some amazing friends because we really care about the people that are outside of our fence line um so they fought for us and I don't know how it went down, but we won. <laughs> so it's like, uh, yeah, so we're like announcing that on Friday. I'm, they're going to be announcing it for me. Oh, that's amazing. Um, yeah. So can you talk a little bit more? I know we're kind of, I don't know how much time you have left. I, got, um, I, I have a, I have to leave in an hour. So you're good. So. Okay. I I'm not going to take up that much time, but <laughs> just a few more minutes. Um, yeah, I like. I would love to know a little bit more about the vision for the future. Um, you've talked about it a little bit, but even just where you really see this going. Yeah, that's. Um, it's hard to say because I never wanted to open to the public. <laughs> you know, it's like so. I I thrive in like chaotic shooting from the hit situations obviously with how this worked out but um the the like farming thing and education thing is like so like such a passion of mine i would really like to like when so like because i have to play the balance game of politics in the house right i have a wife that i have to consider and kids so like to me my my ideal situation is like okay i got a produce farm and i have my like you know, Jurassic Park, amusement park here. <laughs> like, and I was like, I'd really love to like have a small dairy, like a micro dairy uh, and like closer or in some other county. And then like, I'd like, I'd like to have actual meat production, like a ranch so that I could like, I could, I would really love to funnel the future labor force of agriculture, like the future owners of farms. Cause right now when I speak to farmers, that are in the same realm or even more in such larger production, they're like average age is like 70, 85 ish range. <laughs> they're like super old and their kids don't want to take over. So we're going to have this huge gap in labor, which already everybody's already affected by. Like we have this huge gap in labor, but not also a huge gap in leadership in agriculture. So my goal is like, I want to make sure that I can assume enough, like, differences in agriculture that I can funnel these future leaders of agriculture and eventually help them purchase their micro dairy or them purchase their like their cattle production, their goats, whatever, like alpaca farm, whatever it is. 
I want to funnel those future leaders through the use of this little farm to those like little, I don't know, spider web hubs out there. And then they would go find their own place or they go find a farmer that's like, I don't want to take care of this anymore. I'm going to hire you as the, the director of the farm. That's really cool. Yeah. What do you feel like is the biggest misperception um, or misconception um, that people have about farming? Uh, that, that's like a tough, tough thing to say. So, um, here, hold on, these kids are leaving. I'm going to be loud here in a second. Hey, go say, go help that kid feed, okay? Is he he's right. Yeah, he's been here before. But go feed a whole bag. Okay. All right, thanks, Ed. Take Max with you. Max. Okay, sorry. It's four o'clock is a weird time here. <laughs> um, yeah, so the biggest misconception in farming, it's hard to say because farming is such a personal thing that like everybody, each farmer is different, right? Like I'm totally different from almost every farmer, but like, because we're like insane. But um, I, I think what farmers struggle with right now is something that we don't. Um, and something that like, just from our ethnic background, like my family's Mexican, um, farmers are like, these are like recluse, I, like people think that they're like these like recluse uneducated people and they're like you know similar to like a tradesman they're like uneducated they just know how to turn a wrench um but then they kind of like brought that on themselves because they're not inviting right like when you go to mexico and stuff if you walk up a driveway of a farmer they don't meet you with a shotgun and no trespassing signs they meet you with food they're like Bananinos, welcome to my farm. This farm, I produce whatever, berries, uh, agave, I produce cattle. Let me feed you today and I'll teach you about my farm and you can become part of my family. Do you want to help me? No, okay, that's cool, I'll still feed you. So like Mexico, like my culture is just very inviting. So like when, when people come here, I mean, they ask like the very basic questions, like I didn't know girl cows had horns, uh, but most of the time it's this, so they're like, you're the only, they always tell me you're the only farmer that I've ever met that would be open to people coming and learning. And I think that's a huge misconception. It's just that farming is like so demanding, right? Like, I mean, your hands are beat. You're, if the tractor breaks, is, is it cost effective to like hire a mechanic? No, I'm going to fix it. So like, I think I think farmers have some work to do in order to become this like inviting place um, that the community sees. Like that's what farms used to do. The farm used to feed the town, right? So like, I think I think a lot of the misconceptions are kind of like the doing of farmers themselves, because every farmer I know is like extremely intelligent. They they see situations that like aren't in textbooks, right? Like. If you're like rotary mower and the blades are hitting and like you don't know how to fix it like that doesn't happen you figure out how to fix it and then you fix it like that's that's what farming's like and uh but they you know like they're I, and it makes sense because like in the united states we like to sue people so like it's, it's it's a little scary to let people on your property but um also that like one big thing one kind of like small thing that's really big to us is that um everybody thinks farms smell like crap <laughs> like no matter what you produce it's gonna smell like crap and it's like i think that's i mean obviously that's like within the regenerative soil movement that like use a lot of carbon and like try to like compost so that like you know but to us like farms never smell like poop unless they're like hyper dense, you know, animal situations. But um, yeah, like that's probably the biggest thing is like one that they're not inviting, but also that like farm smell and like not all farms smell. <laughs> like uh, my farm doesn't smell and I have a lot of animals and like we just use a lot of carbon and that carbon acts as like a composting accelerant, but also like 
it's a carbon filter it prevents the poop smell <laughs> so it's, it's great um those are probably the two big things because like the inviting thing has to do with your personality and the smell has to do with your practices. So it's, it's super, people don't even know that farms are like within 10 minutes of their house. You know, it's like, it's like, if you didn't know, like if it, it doesn't smell, so you don't know that it's there. <laughs> so it doesn't smell. You just prove yourself wrong. <laughs> but um, yeah. Yeah, those are like the two biggest things, at least from what I see. I'm also, I just started like two years ago, so. <laughs> That's amazing. Uh, man, there's so many more questions I could ask you, but I, I want to respect your time. Um, is there any, are there any other kind of final thoughts or final comments that you'd want to make for this? Um, I would say like when I, when I started this out, you know, as like in the business perspective, um, people, people always advise like everybody, like all financial advisors advise you like, Hey, you need to diversify your passive income, diversify your stocks, diversify your retirement accounts, diversify all this stuff. That's like numbers. Right. But nobody ever, ever tells you to diversify your time right? No one ever tells you diversify the way you make money or you make a living with your actual movement and breathing. <laughs> so like, uh, when I, when I started this little farm, I still had my company going and I was like, you know, like, I don't, it wasn't my passion at the time. So like, I'll just, I'll put a little bit of time here as an investment and maybe it'll give me a return, right? Maybe it'll return something else, like happiness. Maybe it'll return, like, my kids will get inspired and become a farmer. I don't know. But you, a lot of people have this, like, thought of, and this, I mean, this goes against, like, industrial agriculture. It's like, farming is just like, hey, right, corn, that's all you grow. <laughs> but for me, when I was starting this thing, I was like, well, I don't have a lot of land. I don't know what I'm doing. I'm going to diversify so that one thing fails. I have this other revenue source or this other like way to make money or this other way to stay sustainable, this other way to make sure that my labor doesn't get like shorted. So like we, I looked at things in such a diverse array that I was like, not only will it diversify the income in my time, but it also diversifies my like, perspective that I'm taking in. So like if I'm doing therapy, that therapist that's here, gives me totally different advice from like the produce farmer that sells at the farmer's market, right? And that that diversification is awesome. Like it made us sustainable. Like I'm, I made, we made enough money last year to donate back. Like that's in the first year of operation of business that like never happens, <laughs> you know? Like usually you're losing money for at least two years. <laughs> so, but um yeah, I think it's just uh, yeah, like thinking about life as if it was also your portfolio. <laughs> you don't want to be this like boring dude. Like talk to everybody. Everybody is an investment, right? So uh, yeah, that would probably be like my last piece is like I mimic my farm to diversify my life. So I don't know. It's a, you know, hippy dippy stuff. <laughs> I think it's great advice. Yeah. I, I think that's a really good way of, of wrapping it up. Um, well, Gerardo, uh, thank you so much. This is awesome. I mean, wow, I'm I'm amazed by everything that you call it. <laughs> Thanks. That's so cool. Um, thank you, man. Yeah. I'm happy to be here. And uh, don't tell anybody until Friday. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, it'll be a while before this is published and I, I will hold that secret. So yeah. yeah. <laughs> This isn't financial, legal, or medical advice, but we do discuss how we might invest our resources for a healthier society. If you'd like to learn more about today's topic and other public policy issues, check out the website, thejusticepodcast.com.